This is a CBC Podcast. Hi there, I'm Gian Gomeshi, inviting you to enter the world of arts, cultural affairs, and entertainment with Q's video podcast. Feature interviews with the people and personalities shaping, captivating, and challenging culture. Delivered to your mobile device three times a week, visit cbc.ca slash Q to subscribe to the Q video podcast and watch what we're doing. Hello, I'm Matthew Lazenrider, and this is The Invisible Hand. This is a show about economics, the study of the business of everyday life, how people behave when things are scarce, and what they're willing to give up to get what they want. But what about a scenario where everything becomes scarce? What if society as we know it falls apart? What if economies fail? Today on The Invisible Hand, we compare the gold standard of economic backup plans against one of the most foul. We'll look at the difference between price and value, and we pit bullion against bullion to see which one would be most valuable at the end of the world. From the Cold War nuclear threat to the 2008 financial crisis, the world has given us plenty of reasons to be concerned about the future. Just Google economic collapse or natural disaster, and you'll see the world's worries writ large. Those worries are often reflected in the ups and downs of the financial markets. Pensions, investments, a family's nest egg can all take a hit when people start to worry. And when anxiety runs high and the TSX drops low, many people take the flight to safety into the arms of the gold standard of investments, gold itself. The world at six. Here are the headlines. The price of gold continues its phenomenal rise. Every kind of record was being broken by the London bullion market today. The price of During trading today, the price of gold hit a new high, $1,000 an ounce. With the price of gold soaring at nearly $2,000 an ounce, old mining Analysts say gold is certain to continue its rise. Some are even predicting it could double in the foreseeable future. But what if global trade frameworks like the stock market and the London Bullion Exchange ceased to exist? What then would determine gold's value? That is our question today. To begin our search for an answer, we'd like you to meet two people who've taken different approaches to planning for the possibility of economic chaos. All right, yes, my name is Shane White, and uh, I run uh, the Doomsday Moose, which is a uh, prepper uh, website. Basically, we try to keep people up to date on the prepper issues, uh, things uh, related to doomsday. Preppers make up a loose community of people all over Canada and the United States who believe that if trouble comes, they need to be ready. That trouble could come in many forms, but there's one example Shane likes to use so he doesn't defend anyone's politics. <laughs> Zombies is a great place to start because everybody's aware of how quickly things would fall apart in a zombie apocalypse. Although I really doubt that a zombie apocalypse would actually happen, but it's 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 really a great way to get you know someone to starting to talk about it. And say, you know, uh, wh what about zombies? Then you start. Well, what about financial collapse? And and oh, look at this and that. So it's it's really kind of a fun way to get people to uh, start thinking about that stuff. So preppers range from survivalists who make sure they have enough water and food and first aid supplies to get through a disaster, to others who practice bug-out drills and build bunkers and live by the motto beans, bullets, and bullion. That's gold bullion. Shane, well, he says he'd move bullion up higher in that list of must-haves. Gold maintains its value for literally thousands of years. If the dollar collapsed or the euro collapsed or anything like that, and you have gold, you'll be able to use your gold to trade again for whatever the new currency is. E even short term, you know, uh, gold would be a good way to even buy food or whatever from your neighbors uh, in a disaster. So for Shane White, the best hedge against a doomsday scenario, economic or undead, is gold. But Stacy Langford, well, she'd take a different approach with a different kind of bullion. Chickens are lovely. I mean, they're just fantastic to have in the garden. Um, one of my son's first words was bok bok. Uh, he loves the chickens. Um, they'll eat your bugs. They give me someone to talk to when I'm talking to myself in the garden. Um, and it's just a really joyful thing to have in your life. Right now, Stacy lives in Vancouver, where she and her husband raise chickens in coops in their backyard. 
but they're pulling up stakes to move to a farm just outside the city. She's got five acres, lots more room for chickens, for vegetables, and a well with her own safe water supply. Personally, I think it's also um, about knowledge. I think that the knowledge um, on how to feed ourselves, how to maintain chickens, how to look after um, animals that can give us food, that, if these folks are right and we really are running into trouble, that's going to be a lot more valuable. Um, and, you know, if the stock market does go to pot tomorrow, my larder and my chickens are still going to be there and that value is not going to change. And that's something I can control too. So that gives me a lot more sense of security in that regard. So Stacy and Shane are both thinking a lot about the future and their own sustainability and security. And they both make good points. But what would most mainstream economists have to say about their plans? Well, Shane's gold has always held a valued place in economic history. It drove imperial conquests, sparked bloody wars, and inspired prospecting frenzies. We're not aware of any great chicken rushes, and as far as we know, no one's ever gone on an epic quest for a lost city where the streets are paved with poultry. We'll talk more about the value of gold, and then the invisible hand will put gold and chickens together in a steel cage apocalyptic showdown to see who comes up the winner. No chickens were harmed in the making of this imaginary commodity smackdown. I'm Matthew Lazenrider, and you are listening to The Invisible Hand. No chickens here. We welcome your feedback on the show. You can email us anytime at invisiblehand at cbc.ca. It's easy to tell what gold's worth, right? You check the Google or the Twitter or the ticker, and you get a very precise price per ounce. But how is gold's value actually determined in economic terms? Well, it depends on what kind of gold you're talking about. If it's grandma's locket, or your dad's disco chains, then you have to weigh more than just the number of grams in the trinket. You also have to weigh the emotional attachment you have to it. No, no, No. because they're they're way too sentimental. In living rooms around Canada, you can find Tupperware-style parties taking place. The hostess provides bevies and snacks, and the featured entertainment, a gold buyer. The invited guests get the chance to sell their old and unused gold. I can offer you $1,181.77. Done deal. Totally feels like free money. I don't, I don't think I've bought any of this, really, even in the day. I don't. X's is huge. I often get the person that sat down and said, oh, if I only met you last year, I threw mine in the river or I flushed mine or whatever. <laughs> now they're realizing how much it could have made. I don't like taking things that are sentimental. You have to, you know, really want to get rid of it because it all gets recycled and melted down and you won't see it again. I had a pair of earrings, I hope my husband isn't listening, that I never liked, never <laughs> liked, and I, I've never worn. They were just uncomfortable and so off they went. So some gold, maybe not those uncomfortable earrings, has sentimental value. And then there's also cultural value. <laughs> At the jewelry markets of Vancouver's bustling Little India, the customers and shopkeepers say 22 karat gold is the way to go. For Indian uh, culture and communities, like 22 karat gold is real gold for them, and uh, anytime wearing or any special occasions, they like to wear. So that that's a part of uh, the culture traditions of India. Gold is um, also related to goddess of wealth. You know, if you have gold, you have a part of God with you. Uh, it's not just jewelry, it's also a sort of investment for them. So uh, it's it's not hard for the guys to buy their wives jewelry because they know their money's coming home, right? Like people love jewelry and uh, I guess it's a way of showing how wealthy people are. So that's one thing for sure. All right. So gold has sentimental value and it has cultural value. It's an expression of love and an expression of wealth. But none of that explains why the world watches every uptick of the gold market with bated breath. Time to talk to an economist. My name is David Andalfato. I'm a uh, vice president in the research department at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. I also have a joint affiliation with Simon Fraser University, where I've taught since 2000. I'm a professor there in the Department of Economics. With that pedigree, we figured David would be able to give us the goods on gold. Gold plays a minor role in, uh, say, some industrial uses. It plays a significant role in kind of the fashion industry. People like to use it for jewelry. Ultimately, gold is not wealth. Gold represents uh, a way to facilitate trade. So the issue is who's gaining and who's losing and whether trade is being facilitated. I mean, ultimately, wealth depends on, on other things, not the physical quantity of gold. 
So gold is now used to help facilitate trade. But there was a time when the physical quantity of gold actually embodied the wealth of a nation. That's why we have this expression, the gold standard. At one time, for every bill in circulation, there had to be a bunch of gold somewhere in a country's vaults. Let's look back at those golden years of Canada's history. At the dawn of our nation, when Canada was a mixed bag of various British possessions, the most widely accepted form of tender was the Spanish silver dollar. Yes, Spain had a handy mint in Mexico, and some of those lovely silver coins made their way up here to Canada. While the average British colonist probably had a few sovereigns and shillings in his or her pocket, it was the Spanish silver dollar that was the real big deal. And you knew they were worth something, because hey, they were made out of silver. By the time we became the province of Canada, regional banks here were issuing their own notes. You'd have one Bank of Montreal dollar and one Nova Scotia pound, backed by their own holdings of all kinds of coinage and capital. It was weird and confusing. You'd go to the store and pay two pounds and a shilling for your groceries and get back three BMO dollars and 20 pence. So, in 1854, something needed to be done about this, and whammo, the Currency Act came into being. It set every bank's unit of account to a standard measure of gold. One Canadian dollar equals 0.048375 ounces of shiny yellow metal. And the important part, if you took your bill to the bank and asked for your tiny slice of gold, they had to give it to you. Everything went fine and dandy until 1914. World War I broke out, and everyone ran to the bank hoping to get their gold before the world fell apart. To avoid all the banks going belly up, the Canadian government removed the rules about converting your paper to gold. They made banknotes the legal tender for all transactions, and the rest is history. Except for 1926 to 1931 when we got back on the gold standard again, but just temporarily. Woo! So we've had a long, economically complicated relationship with gold. Just like days gone by, politics play a role. But even though it's been 70 years since our currency was tied to our stores of precious metals in North America, the debate about whether it should be hasn't been laid to rest. As promised, Republican Congressman Ron Paul of Texas joins us right now on Varney and Company. The foundation has eroded. It is going to come. But I think if we'll be lucky if we can go two or three more years without a, without a currency crisis, which means that we're going to have a lot of inflation and we're going to have disruption a lot worse than we've seen already. Ron Paul a potential Republican nominee for the U.S. presidency. He's spoken out in favor of a return to the gold standard. The reason, if central banks have to back up their currency with gold, then governments can't just print all of the money they want. And then wads of hollow paper money can't just get thrown around willy-nilly, causing price inflation. And political commentators all over America say they've seen this issue show up on their radars. Hey, I'm Thomas Frank. And I am the Easy Chair columnist at Harper's Magazine. He's also an economic historian. He's written extensively about the intersection of markets and politics. I, I just finished a book tour, by the way. So you go around the country and you, you talk on radio stations. This is how you promote a book. You're on radio stations. They obviously take calls from listeners. And uh, the listeners are all absolutely convinced that the federal government, with its liberal meddling, caused the financial crisis. It's completely untrue. But second of all, the listeners are all convinced that hyperinflation, not just regular, not just like you know 3% inflation a year or something like that, but hyperinflation is right around the corner. Everybody is convinced of this. And this is three and a half years after the financial crisis. So what does that have to do with gold? Can you remove the L? Gold is God. It's the enforcer, you know, of the free market system. If you, if you have a gold standard, then government is restrained and it can't meddle in the economy. It can't adjust the size of the currency in circulation, the amount of currency in circulation. It's it's highly ironic that in, you know, in the aftermath of, you know, we've been deregulating and trying to reach for this sort of uh, what they call in America is this sort of free market system. We've been trying to get there for 40 years, and as disaster after disaster after disaster befalls us, and our response to it now is to say, well, we just need to go all the way and you know get government out of the picture altogether, 
you get back on a gold standard. I mean, it's, it makes you laugh. You know, it's ridiculous. But that seems to be the only solution to our problems that people can imagine anymore is to sort of uh, reach out for this kind of 19th century system. In case you're wondering, gold fever isn't just an American political phenomenon. It's not going to show up in the campaign platforms of any of the major parties here in Canada. But there are Canadians who put more trust in gold than they do in government. My name is Jeff Berwick. I founded Stockhouse.com in 1995 and sold the company around 2002. It's still the largest financial website in Canada, has about a million users. Sometime after Jeff made his millions with that company, he decided that any government was too much government in the marketplace. He says gold won't fix all of the problems he has with government, but it could help with some of them. The Canadian government, unbeknownst to almost any Canadian, sold all their gold, almost all, uh, in uh, the 1980s and 90s. Uh, the amount of gold that the Canadian government has now is worth about $120 million. Uh, it's a, less than 1% of their total reserves. The, uh, all that's backing the Canadian dollar is uh, U.S. dollars at this point, and the U.S. dollar is headed to zero, for sure. If you're going to have a government run your monetary system, which you never want to do, but if you do do it, uh, you want to have it at least backed by something so that they can't just print as much money as they want, because if they can, they will. So does a gold standard actually make money more reliable and government more honest somehow? Here's economist David Andalfato. Something that I don't think the, uh, you know, the, the gold bugs in the United States or the hard money or the Ron Paul types uh, fully appreciate, I don't think, is, uh, you know, just because you have a gold standard in the sense that, say, the government is restricted or let's say the Federal Reserve is restricted to issue their paper uh, such that it's made redeemable in gold. Um, you know, these types of gold standard regimes also require faith on the part of the, of the citizenry that the government will credibly commit to the standard and not at some point abrogate these laws uh, if, if the government finds it in their interest to do so. All right. So part of why we value gold so much could be because in the back of our collective minds, we still connect it with something huge and important, like the foundations of our monetary system. But many economists point out even the gold standard is based on human constructs like trust and integrity. Maybe that's why a recent survey of 40 prominent economists at North America's leading universities got unanimous results. They all agreed they would not want to see a return to the gold standard. One even pondered, why not 1982 Bordeaux instead? Maybe that will be our next episode of The Invisible Hand. The Bordeaux Standard. Okay, maybe not. I'm Matthew Lazenrider, and you are listening to The Invisible Hand on CBC Radio 1 and across North America on Sirius 159. Check out our webpage at cbc.ca slash The Invisible Hand. Now let's get back to our search for the true value of gold. Maybe the answer to why we give gold more respect than, say, chickens can be found in the marketplace. Maybe it's the interplay of supply and demand, of scarcity and control. After all, gold isn't just lying around on every street corner. In the 1948 classic Treasure of the Sierra Madre, Walter Houston plays a down-on-his-luck prospector looking for another shot at riches. He's chased his golden dream halfway around the world, but even he is under no illusions about the intrinsic worth of the yellow dust. So you answer me this, will you? Why is gold worth some 20 bucks an ounce? I don't know, because it's scarce. A thousand men say go searching for gold. After six months, one of them's lucky, one out of the thousand. This find represents not only his own labor, but that of 999 others to boot. That's uh, 6,000 months or 500 years, scrabbling over mountains, going hungry and thirsty. Now, it's a gold, mister, is worth what it is because of the human labor that went into the finding and the getting of it. Gold and stuff ain't good for nothing except for making jewelry with gold teeth. <laughs> ah, gold's a devilish sort of a thing anyway. The old prospector isn't far off the truth. Gold is really valuable in part because it's very expensive to get out of the ground. Right now, it costs about $600 just to produce one ounce of gold. But for a big chunk of the last decade, it was selling for less than it cost to mine it. So production and supply factors, that can't be the only thing that makes us value that devilish stuff. 
That can't be what makes us want to gather up gold and take it back underground and into the bunker we're building for the apocalypse. But real gold advocates, known as gold bugs, will still tell you that owning bullion is a good investment. Not everyone agrees. Back to Thomas Frank of Harper's Magazine. For the real committed gold bug, there's only one way. You buy the physical gold and, and <laughs> store it in your basement, right? Or in a safe deposit box in the bank downtown. Thomas Frank's coverage of the gold buying trend led him to look at an institution other than the bank downtown. The University of Texas uh, last summer bought a huge stake in gold and not just in um, uh, paper gold, like I mentioned before, like uh, uh, shares of a gold mining company or, you know, futures or something like that, but in actual physical gold. So they took delivery on the gold and it's sitting in a vault somewhere in Manhattan. Can, Can I just tell you something? Gold is actually a really bad investment. It doesn't pay interest. It doesn't pay you dividends like a share of stock does or a bond does. Uh, you have to pay to store it, right? So they've got it in a vault somewhere with armed guards, you know, making sure that nobody swipes it. And it's really damn heavy. It's not liquid. I know gold is supposed to be close to being money, right? They could sell it in any country on earth, you know, whatever. It's really heavy. It's hard to move it around. It's not a simple thing. So gold doesn't pay dividends or interest, and it's heavy. Warren Buffett, the investment guru and financier, says the thing that actually drives the market for gold is the market for gold. We couldn't get Warren Buffett to come on the show. We figured we'd ask for a little help from a friend to read one of Warren Buffett's letters to his investors. This one was all about gold. I'm Stuart McLean from the Vinyl Cafe with a letter that comes to us from Warren Buffett of Omaha, Nebraska. Warren writes, A major category of investments involves assets that will never produce anything, but that are purchased in the buyer's hope that someone else will pay more for them in the future. The major asset in this category is gold, currently a huge favorite of investors who fear almost all other assets, especially paper money. Gold, however, has significant shortcomings, being neither of much use nor procreative. If you own an ounce of gold for an eternity, you'll still own one ounce at its end. What motivates most gold purchasers is their belief that the ranks of the fearful will grow. Thanks, Stuart. So what Warren Buffett was saying in that letter is that part of gold's rise in price is because people with market fears are buying gold, hoping that other people with market fears will buy it from them for a higher price. So even when we talk about gold as an investment, it's our emotions that help determine the value we put on it. Now more than ever, the emotion that's driving the price of gold is fear. The prepper community is the most extreme example of this. Preppers continue to buy gold at high prices because they believe it will hold its value at the end of the world. So what happens if the preppers' worst fears come true? What if there were a catastrophic disaster that sent us all running for the bunker? When it's safe to come out again, there are no banks, no bullion exchanges. What then would determine the value of gold? One of the ways economists still measure the value of a commodity is its utility. In economics, utility is defined as the satisfaction derived from the expenditure of a resource. So we'll use this as our ultimate test. Let's go back to our two families, planning in their different ways for scenarios where our lives take a drastic shift. It could be natural disaster, economic collapse, or of course... Zombies. Where would mainstream economists put their money when asked if gold or chickens would be a better hedge against the apocalypse? Would they go with our doomsday prepper, Shane White? Do you want to have the bullion gold or something to trade either uh, short term or long term? Because even the best laid out plan is not going to include everything because you're not going to be able to see exactly into the future. You might be ready for one thing, but you're going to you're going to need to have something to trade with your neighbors. Or would those economists go with our urban chicken aficionado, Stacy Langford? Chickens all the way. Well, it's the true golden goose, isn't it? I mean, would you rather have one lump of gold or a bunch of hens that can feed you for years? 
we put the invisible hand question of the day to our economist, David Andalfato. Suppose I believed in the doomsday scenario. You know, storing my wealth in the form of gold is probably not the first thing that would come to my mind. I mean, um, you know, if I think of uh, I think of the producers or the writers of the that uh, show with Mel Gibson, Mad Max. I'm a fuel injected suicide machine. Which is kind of like uh, uh, end of the world scenario, and I, I think they, the writers got it just about right, right? I mean, when they're thinking about what the world is going to be look like. What is going to be valued? What are people going to be fighting for? And I don't ever recall in that show uh, gold being something that they were using. I mean, it was fuel, you know, water. I mean, it's like precious resources. Precious resources like... I think that's a wonderful idea. I mean, as long as, you know, they don't put all of their eggs in one basket. Um, Eggs, food, you know, uh, capital of that. Chickens are a form of, of producing capital. I mean, that's going to be much more valuable than gold. I mean, imagine waking up in the morning in your little bunker. you got a nice fresh egg sitting there, as opposed to looking at a shiny gold bar. I mean, it, gold tastes terrible. I mean, it's not very nutritious. And so the winner in our post-apocalyptic value Thunderdome, the chickens. Not only are they more nutritious than gold, chickens have qualities that economists say gold does not. Gold lacks utility, beyond its use as decoration or dental work, and gold is unproductive. It won't grow as a physical asset. Chickens, on the other hand, will give you an egg a day with the potential to become another whole chicken. And useful? Why, there's chicken pot pie and chicken burgers and fried chicken, and of course, chicken bouillon. Those qualities, productivity, utility, many economists say that is what defines something's intrinsic value. So forget the London Bullion Exchange, that's just where they determine price. Even when gold hits record highs, its economic value pretty much the same as it's been forever. So spare a thought for the lowly chicken, the real, bright, shiny, valuable must-have when the world ends. Time for the invisible hand to retreat into the bunker. We'll be back in seven days right here on CBC Radio 1 and Sirius 159. Meantime, you can hear exclusive web extras like the full interview with Jeff Berwick, the Canadian advocate of the gold standard, and download our podcast as well. You'll find us online at cbc.ca slash the invisible hand. We'd love to hear your feedback on the show, which you can send to invisiblehand at cbc.ca. Our producer is Jeff Turner. Our economic consultant is Stephen Gordon. Our senior producer is Karen Burgess. And I'm Matthew Lazenrider. Until next week, remember not to count your golden chickens until the warm glow of the post-nuclear apocalypse makes them hatch. Looking for more CBC Podcasts? Go to cbc.ca slash podcasting.